Hello, my name is Miriam Devitt and you're very welcome to our Screenwriting Roundtable where I'll be talking to seven screenwriters, all of whom have worked screening in this year's Dublin International Film Festival. And they are Jade Jordan, Ali O'Rourke, Connor McMahon, Rainek Griefer, Colin Braid, Kate Dolan and Donald Foreman. So you're all very welcome. And I'd like to start by asking you guys to just introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your um, selves in your film that you have in the festival and a tiny little biog of your um, careers to date. So let me start with Connor. Um, okay, uh, so where did I start? I guess I started making films when I was about 15 with my little camcorder and that progressed onto Dunleary, uh, National Film School there. And after that, I worked in TV, RTE for a couple of years on Republic of Telly. And I've usually always worked just in the horror or horror comedy or comedy. <laughs> it's always a variation right, of those. Right. And uh, so the film I have in the festival, it's called Let the Wrong One In. It's a, it's a vampire comedy, um, basically about two brothers and one of them ends up a vampire. And it's really up to the other brother is he going to help him or is he going to kill him? And that's his dilemma. Nice. Well, looking forward to hearing more about that. Thanks, Connor. Um, next up, Kate. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Kate Dolan. So I'm the writer director of You Are Not My Mother, which is screening at DIFF this year. Um, similar to Connor, uh, I love working in the horror space. So You Are Not My Mother is a horror feature, um, which is about a teenage girl whose mother is suffering from depression and she goes missing one day and the family fear the worst but she returns but uh when she returns she's her behavior becomes increasingly strange and supernatural elements start to reveal themselves um it's very much inspired by irish folklore and um but set in a very kind of modern urban setting um yeah i've always loved horror movies i think uh, I've worked in kind of different disciplines like commercials, music videos, that kind of stuff, but horror films are kind of always been my passion and probably nurtured by the fact I was raised by a single mother who let me kind of watch films with her that were definitely um, not really suitable for the age I was probably. <laughs> so that's probably where it all began. But yeah, I also went to IDT, uh, the National Film School, same as Connor did as well. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. And I should say Kate is a Discovery Award nominee for this year, as is uh, Reenoch. So oh, just having a cough there. Uh, Reenoch, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Reenoch Negreer. Um, similar to Connor and Kate, I also went to IEDT and have a horror film in this year's um, film festival, um, which I wrote and directed called Don't Go Where I Can't Find You. It's about a composer who um, uses music to communicate with um, the ghost of her recently deceased partner. Um, and kind of similarly, I you know I think genre films have always been at the corner of every or the the center of absolutely everything I do. I worked in development for five years um, as development exec for Samson Films. Also wrote for for Fair City and um, do a lot of script editing as well, but recently just solely writing, directing and a little bit of producing as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Irina. Um, Donal. Hi, uh, I'm Donal and uh, yeah, I had a similar start to Connor, um, started making films as a kid and used to submit films to the Fresh Film Festival in Limerick every year, which is where I met Connor as a teenager. And um, also went to IADT. And uh, yeah, the film that I have uh, at DIFF is uh, my third feature called The Cry of Grania Whale. Um, and it's a kind of strange take on the myth and history of Grania Whale, aka Grace O'Malley, about an American filmmaker who comes to Ireland to research a film about her. And um, before that, I made. Um, Two other features, a fiction called Out of Here and a documentary, The Image You Missed, both of which I had at Dublin Film Festival in years before. Amazing. Great. Thanks, Journal. And Ali. 
Hi, uh, I'm Ali O'Rourke. I'm a screenwriter, stand-up comedian, and uh, accidental actress from Athlone, uh, now based out of Dublin. Uh, I have a short movie, uh, which is my debut uh, at the festival this year, called Punchline, which I made alongside the wonderful Becky Cheadle. And uh, yeah, it's uh, about a transgender comedian getting beaten up. Uh, so naturally, it's a comedy. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very excited to be here. I did not go to Ireland. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Exceptional. Love it. Well, uh, really looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, so let's hear from Colin. Hey, Dan. Um, I'm Colin Barade. I'm, uh, I have a feature playing at the Dublin Film Festival this year called I'm Colin Keane, which is my first feature film. Um, it's an Irish language film. It was made as part of the Cinecar scheme. And I guess, yeah, a lot of my work uh, I guess I started working in TV about like, 15 years ago um, and I've been doing a lot of documentary work uh, for all the different broadcasters but kind of throughout that time always trying to get shorts made and uh, even a lot of my documentary work I was sort of doing a lot of it's kind of a dirty word but doing a lot of docudrama uh, which some of which I'm actually quite proud of but um, yeah so just a lot of uh, uh, a lot of I think you can kind of see I'm always sort of moving towards drama in terms of the stuff I've been doing but um, yeah really excited now to it'll be our Irish premiere at DIFF so really excited to get people to see the film Brilliant great thanks Colin and last but definitely not least Jade Hey um, I'm Jade Jordan I'm an actor writer I have The Quarter Between in DIFF this year which is my first short film it's based on an interracial couple. Um, a drama happens within the family, um, a death, excuse me. And there's a question whether I, my character is able to go to the funeral or not due to her appearance. It's based on a true story. I just fictionalized it a bit, a bit and it was set in the eighties originally and I just made it more modern day. Um, I suppose the reason I did it was just to start a conversation. I kind of think it's, we don't speak about it a lot here in Ireland, so. Yeah, I guess that's why we, we do art is to start a conversation. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Jade. So um, I want to, they're like so interesting and such a broad range of um, genres and approaches to film. So um, let's get stuck into some of those works. Um, Ali, tell us about how you came to write your film and um, what was the inspiration behind it? Yeah, um, well... Basically, being a stand-up comedian, didn't have a whole lot to do during the last two years. Uh, so, yeah, um, started screenwriting, started experimenting, uh, a bit like Kate, a little bit raised by TV. So always had a passion for it, always wanted to do it and never took the time to actually do delve into it. So I just started trawling back um, through a lot of my experiences. I think it's something you'll find a lot of stand-up comedians will do because the art form is so confessional. So I think that influenced... Um, it influenced uh, where I went with my screenwriting. But uh, yeah, so basically it's based on a personal experience and uh, that's what I drew upon. Uh, of a, As I like to put it, I brought a skateboard to a knife fight and uh, I won. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it. And do you feel that you're the stand-up, like you have a lot of experience in stand-up and do you feel that that's kind of a good way into screenwriting? You know, having... Obviously, you have to craft your tight 10 and you have to, there's a lot of writing involved in stand-up as well. But did that help you, do you feel, when you're writing for screen? I definitely think writing is writing no matter what you're doing, but they are very different art forms, you know. And uh, I think, yeah, I'm definitely more experienced in the stand-up realm than in the screenwriting realm. So it was very interesting to try, take the skills I, over the last few years that I've learned from stand-up and transfer them across. But and a huge part of the process was figuring out what didn't transfer and what didn't work in a cinematic kind of sense. Um, so yes and no is the answer. Right, right. And what did you find like didn't work? Like what was how did you, what was the journey into like discovery? You know, you're, if you're making your first film, like how does that? Um, what's that process for you like? Um, well, I think it's it's such a weird one because with stand up, you everything is story, as in verbal storytelling. You don't have that visual element at all, apart from yourself, your own act out 
uh, act outs of characters that you might encounter in the, during the story. So you have this much richer, much richer tapestry to build with uh, because you can show everything that's happened, everything that is, and you have, I guess, multiple viewpoints, which is something you just don't have in stand up. Every story you tell through stand up will just ha be put through your own prism and not, uh, yeah, you just can't see it. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a strange uh, process to try transfer that across and try adapt as a storyteller to having this uh, bigger skill set to play with. Yeah. And like, it's such a personal story. Was that hard or was it cathartic? Like what was, what was that for you? Um, yeah, no, uh, a bit of both. Uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely was cathartic. Uh, gave myself my first panic attack on set. Uh, but apart from that, <laughs> No, apart, we've all been there <laughs> yeah yeah well it was more um having to relive it was an interesting experience as an actress uh but um at the same time it definitely afterwards it was a cathartic experience uh it it, it um allowed me to process a lot of stuff that has happened uh it's a lot of um things like when i first started stand-up uh i always found uh I always found it really powerful being a trans woman, be having a whole room listen to you. It's something that you wouldn't ex experience normally. So when I was filmmaking, uh, it was very uh, interesting to just ha expand that even more and just uh, take this narrative of something that's happened and take complete control of it, create a universe where you're completely in control of that situation. So I think in terms of processing trauma, that's a very interesting experience because you literally rewrite your experience. Yeah. And like, how does comedy, you know, the tears of a clown and all that, you know, comedy and tragedy are so closely aligned. How how did you come to that in the first place? And, uh, you know, what made you want to share your stories with through comedy as opposed to any other medium? Again, I think it is when you're from a minority background, I think it can be quite intoxicating just to literally be listened to. Uh, so it's such a interesting one in that sense. But um, yeah, like the whole short really is because it is set within a stand up world. It's uh, telling the story via flashback uh, while whilst on stage. Um, it really is about how when you're from a minority background, when you're a trans person, you have to present and package your pain and trauma in a way that is digestible to a cis audience. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's such an important topic. And I, I'm, it's already been really well received. I know you were supported by Virgin originally and that in um, and now obviously you're getting screened at Diff. So I'm I can't wait to see it. So thanks so much, Ali. Fabulous. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. Um, so let's jump over to our Irish language film. Um, Colm, I was so like thrilled when I was watching Aracht in um, the IFI because I suddenly uh, halfway through it realized we're so used to watching um, foreign language films with um, subtitles. But I was like, wait, this is an Irish, this is the first Irish language film I've ever seen in, in the cinema. Um, so I'm uh, really excited about it on Colleen Kuhn. Can you tell us about your film and your journey to this feature. Sure, yeah. So, uh, Uncalli Kuhn is actually, an, it's an adaptation of uh, a much loved short, well, long short story by Claire Keegan uh, called Foster, which um, I think it was on the leaving syllabus until recently. So I think a lot of, you know, teenagers or people in their early twenties might be familiar with it. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a story, it's a very simple story. It's quite a, as, as I said, it's a short story. So it was a sort of, um, it was kind of one of the challenges was like expanding it to fit the canvas of a, a feature film. But uh, it's essentially the story of a young girl from a dysfunctional rural family and she gets uh, sent away for the summer. And um, this is 1981, it's like the early 1980s. She gets sent away for, for the summer from her kind of overcrowded family to live with these dis distant relatives of hers that she's never met. And the film becomes an examination of the, the relationship that develops between this girl and these sort of surrogate parents over the course of that summer. Um, so yeah, it's quite a, 
tender and I think considered sort of story at the original is, is very much all of those things. And I hope, I hope our film is somewhat that as well. Um, so yeah, I just, I read Claire's story in 2018 and uh, it just blew me away. I, it was just, it was becoming a film in my head, like as I was reading it. And I was also very, very aware that the Cine Car scheme was uh, looking for ideas. And I was like, this would absolutely work as an Irish language. Because uh, the book is obviously English language, but the the setting, the rural setting, and everything like that, you could so easily sort of transplant it into a Guelta setting, and it's completely believable mm. and organic and all of that. Um. So yeah, and it was, yeah, I, I just, <laughs> it was like a, a kind of a panic was setting in the more I read it because I was like, are the rights available for this? <laughs> or uh, by the, when I got to the end of it, I was like in tears at the end. I was like, surely someone has the rights to this. There's no way like the rights are available. But miraculously, they, they were available. And um, yeah, we managed to secure them and yeah, took it from there. Amazing. And had you just happened across this short story or did you see, were you looking for original material to adapt or how did you yeah. come to it? Yeah, no, I was. Um, and I was specifically looking for like a female protagonist because that was one of the conditions of the next round of the Cine Cahar that I was applying for. So I remember reading, I was just looking up because I, I wanted to find like a literary piece, an Irish piece uh, written by a woman. Um, and I just remember looking up like, what are the best? There was an article in the Irish Times, like the 10 best uh, novels of this, this century uh, written by female authors. And wow, Foster. Okay. Foster was one of them. So um, I kind of went through the list. I, I, I read a few of them. And uh, yeah, so once I read Foster, though, that was it. I was, yeah. Hooked. That mm. spoke to your heart. It's interesting to come with those constraints in mind. So you're kind of, you were writing to a scheme specifically. So how does that affect your filmmaking if you are um, coming with those restrictions in mind? Um, in a way, the scheme, The scheme itself, I'm making, I mean, you get total freedom. Like TG Carr throughout my career have been amazing in terms of the space they give um, and their whole philosophy on, on the content that, that they create. Um, it was more actually the Claire Keegan's work itself was imposing a set of restrictions, which are, which are strangely kind of liberating because, you know, it's a first person narrative told in the present tense. So it's all from this girl's point of view. So like with yeah. first person narrative, it's, there's a whole bunch of things that you suddenly can't do because it feels incorrect or, you know, basically anything outside of the scope of the girl's experience is off the table from a mm -hmm. writing point of view. And then also from a filming point of view as well, obviously it, it informs everything creatively um, in terms of the film. So it, it, they were the, they were the sort of restrictions that I felt it was more the stuff that was embedded in the, this conceptually almost in, in the work rather than, uh, the scheme or, or anything that came with the scheme. Okay. And was it really important to you to honour that original material really closely or did you feel you could take liberties with the story as you were adapting it? Um, it was, yeah, I mean, it was very important to try and preserve what was there, but like essentially it was a sort of an additive process and that, as I said earlier, it's it's a short story. So I did have to add like basically the film or the, the short story begins about a, about a third of the way into the film. So like act two is the, act, is the beginning of the literary source material. Right. So I had to create an act one essentially. Um, okay. But even the process of doing that was like, you were kind of, I was picking up on details that were there in the, the, the literary source material in terms of like backstory. Like there's a, like little tiny mentions of characters and things. And so you would use those and expand upon them uh, to try and build this first act in terms of uh, how that would relate to the to the rest of it. But yeah. yeah, that was the that was the main thing. Brilliant. And thematically, would you say there's a kind of through line from your work to date, like previous work, into on Colin Kuhn? There's certainly um, a preoccupation with younger protagonists. I mean, most of my, nearly all of my short films are centered on young people. Um, it's not something that I, I, I only kind of became aware of this recently when I was looking back and just thinking about stuff I'd done. Uh, 
so yeah I certainly have a preoccupation with like childhood experiences and and the whole question of family and family dynamics um right yeah so. awesome no, that it sounds amazing. I can't wait to see it. Thanks so much, Calm. Um, speaking of um, younger um, protagonists, Jade, your character is based on a younger you, essentially, is it? It's actually not. It's based on my mom. Oh, your yeah. sorry, your mom. Right. Yeah, yeah. her experience. Back in the eighties. Yeah. Um, so this and is tell us. Sorry, go on, far away. Uh, so yeah, tell us how you came to adapt her story and why you wanted to tell it as a short uh, short film so like Ali in the lockdown I kind of didn't know what to do with my time um with more time than we ever had but in 2016 I started recording my granny just asking her questions I always thought her story was amazing just popped up a camera tripod and every year I was living in London at the time I'd come home and just ask her questions so I just dug out these videos in the lockdown and just started writing which I'd never ever done before I actually didn't think I could do it. Um, there you have it. You learn, don't you, that you, you have a skill you didn't know you had. Well, you'd, I think I do, okay. I don't know. But um, yeah, I started delving into these and one of one of the specific stories kind of, it just kept playing around and around in my head. And then a pal had sent over a scheme called The Actor is Creator. And he said to me, I know you're delving into your family story and you're gonna try and attack some writing. And he said, why didn't you apply for this first? And I thought, oh, God, I couldn't do that. But anyway, I did. And um, so basically the story was my, my mom not being able to go to her grandmother's funeral in the 80s because of her appearance. Um, and for me, that's just, I just always remember that story. And I just thought this was a really important story to tell. You know, I think the world kind of took a shift with the death of George Floyd in 2020. And I thought, well, why not? let me be a voice and show people that that actually does and did still happen here in Ireland, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So I went forward with the application, I suppose, and I was really lucky that um, Dave Tynan came on board. It was my first script. And I, I will say every line I wrote was like, a <laughs> he was like, you just need to bring it back. That's too much. But I suppose you, you have to learn, don't you? Um, I think I learned in it less is more what, What's not said is obviously more important, you know? Um, and I knew all these things from reading scripts, being an actor, but when it comes to yourself and when it's so personal, I guess you want to protect those people. You know, I had to run it by my mom because it's it's her it's her thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but the budget didn't allow for, I would have likened to set it in the eighties. And then I kind of thought to myself, well, look, actually it's really relevant now. So it doesn't really matter when it's set. Um, but it was, it, was a, it was an amazing process, I mean, small budget, mid lockdown, um, you know, using a, using a baby, trying to produce it, trying to costume it, trying to set it. It was, um, yeah, it was phenomenal. I mean, I never doubted producers, but wow, they're amazing. <laughs> amazing. But they re like really producing is the hardest thing. <laughs> it really is. But um, like, it's such a personal story. And I think that's what connects with audiences. As When you're a writer, you know, the most you you can be people want to see a, a unique specific voice and do you find that your experience as an actor kind of helped you with your writing I think it did for sure I think it did for sure like working with Dave I was coming up with ideas um and he was going oh well you have a better understanding because it's your story and well, you're an actor so we kind of obviously it was scripted but we did just play around with it on the day as well I think I had that freedom and we were at a place where um, we did just let the camera roll um, and discover it on the day. But no, it did inform it. And I suppose it was really hard, you know. Um, for, for me, that story still, I'm like, how did that happen? Why did that happen? Um, yeah. well, it was tough, you know. It was really, really tough doing, there was a big scene in the middle of it. Um, and having to do it was really tough and re not relive them for myself, but we lived that. I've never had that experience, you know. I've had had experience of discrimination, but never to that extent, and from, especially not from family, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah, no, it was it was a process, and it's something that I would love to do more with the story itself, um, because they've, the family have a cracking story, you know, so. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, again, it's been really well received, it's been aired through the actor as creator 
schemes variously and you know people are really touched by it and moved by it so I like hopefully it will go on to you know that you now that you've discovered your voice as a writer that you can go on with that as well and um, do you know what's next for it are you planning on expanding it I am I'm in the talks with um a few people about expanding it so um I just kind of need to get my writing hat back on and that's something like I'm in a room with writers here <laughs> I really feel like I can't I, can, I can't really call myself that but so look, we're getting um, there. <laughs> if you're writing, you're a writer. So yeah, <laughs> you're, a, but, you're um, on a screenwriting panel. You're yeah, good. No, of course. <laughs> but you know, I kind of, I'm learning that uh, at the beginning, I was like really trying to be strict with myself and go sit down today, do from nine to one. Actually, when you find a calling, you just get a calling. And I find that's actually, don't be hard on myself that I'm not getting four hours done a day. It'll just come and it was surprising it comes when you're in bed and you're like, right, I need to get up now at two in the morning. You're like, where did that come from? But yeah, let's just roll with it. Coffee's my pal. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah, no, you're dead. That's that's like never a true word spoken. There is a lot of time as a writer that you spend thinking and walking and listening to music, and that's writing. It's trying to tell yourself that is writing too. Um brilliant. Thanks, Jada. I really Delighted this is screening at Diff. Can't wait to see it again. Um, so let's move to a completely different genre. Um, Rimak, tell us about your horror. Uh, well, the film is called Don't Go Where I Can't Find You. Um, we got the Dunleary Arts, um, Dunleary Council Fund, um, and as well as Samson Films had a bit of money from the Creative Europe Slate Funding Award to butt towards this. So we were able to, um, that's Claire McCabe, producer, and, and me, we put together um, a small enough budget for something that was quite ambitious. And we wanted to make a slightly different horror movie that's more kind of horror adjacent than a straight horror. Then again, what, what is the horror movie <laughs> these days? It's kind of anything that has the hallmarks and tropes can be can be horror. And I think this it, it, it qualifies, but it's definitely more of a drama. And I, I think we wanted to do something um, a little bit different in terms of how we told the story. We wanted to really make a film where we relied on the sound design and the music element of the script, um, as well as just you know, how we're going to create every single shot to tell, not just tell a story, but to create a feeling. And I think it's a different kind of, uh, you know, technique of screenwriting, I guess, because you're writing it from the point of view of a director wanting to immerse someone in an entirety of what this world is, knowing that you're trying to bring an audience through a hypersensory experience that's not necessarily, you know, hammering home every single plot point and coming from a background in script editing where you kind of you know these are rules that sort of are um hardwired into your entire existence yeah. you, know, you sort of you you're the one that is giving the notes to everybody as to where is your you know turning point and you know this character doesn't know what they want can we find out why she wants it and I think this is sort of a probably a weird response to having spent so many years doing that is the films that I like, that I love to watch, like by Peter Strickland and all these really great um, horror filmmakers like Ari Aster and Robert Eggers. I think that what, what they're really great at is completely immersing you in an entire experience of what the medium is. And I love writing that sort of bears that in mind as well. So to create um, a film that is about a composer who wants to communicate with the partner of um, her partner who's recently died, don't know why, don't, we just know there's something driving her to do it. But then each uh, movement of this suite sort of creates um, a point on her character's arc where she's going through this experience of grief, of violent trauma to longing and sadness to um, a bit of kind of hope and relief at the end so that kind of formed what the structure was and we did it was interesting to do the score before we shot anything as well and we had that just, yeah so did, did you work closely with the composer after you'd written the script or was it kind of happening at the same time 
pretty much at the same time, like we definitely knew we needed to get the script into the shape of what, how the score was going to work for the film. But we, you know, I think it became fairly clear. Um, I think and because we were in COVID, it was a good at least six months before when we had the finished score and I was listening to it every single day before we shot it, which is great if, you, if you've got the liberty of being able to, to, uh, to have um, those things. And it created a spine for what the film was going to be and how you could put your shot lists and things like that and kind of design what you then needed. And I suppose, yeah, they kind of worked in uh, close proximity to one another, but um, <coughs> the composers, um, Benedict Schlepper Connolly and Gareth Schuldeis from Ergodos Musicians are just, they were just pros. And, you know, we we were very clear about what we wanted from each, um, each um, movement in the suite. And right. I'd send like a playlist based on other pieces of music that evoke the same feeling and same tempo. And this is, you know, it, you were basically writing her inner arc of like, she's angry, there's violence, needs to be some kind of technical thing here. And this one is more about the descent into madness and things like that. So I think it was, it was an interesting way to come at a character through the expression of her music. And then Marie, when she was performing that, had this whole journey already recorded to, to work from as well. Yeah. And what was your inspiration for that character in the first place? Where did that come from? I kind of always love m movies about tortured musicians. <laughs> I think they, like, they're just my favorite genre of, you know, psychological thriller or drama. Like the piano is one of my favorite films of all time. I watched that way too young and you just fell in love with, you know, this voiceless character who uses the piano to evoke what her, her, her yeah. soul is and the piano teacher. And they're sort of, you know, films like The Piano Teacher kind of, um, they're, you know, that's a, that's a horror film to me because of how dark and scary and yeah. psychological it is. And it's, you know, to have a character that's as well always kind of represented by the megalomaniacal male torture genius. Um, you know, like something like Phantom Thread was a really big, uh, that kind of Svengali relationship was a big note for us as well but uh just like the idea of a really tortured female queer um genius in this world where uh there are only women <laughs> there's no male characters in it at all and there's just this kind of ether of um hopefully ether of sensuality and um feelings and heightened melodramatic emotions um but we just also we also had such a great cast who were able to just you know again that kind of less is more thing you don't want to say too yeah. much and again like Jade you find yourself sort of stripping away things you want to overtly point out to the audience and just leave it with a look between two great actors and trust your actors mm -hmm. are adding to what you want to say and immerse your audience in. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Sounds incredible. I'm already immersed. I, I could talk to each of you for so long about your film, but we have to get through everyone. I'm conscious of time. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Irina. Um, staying with the horror genre, Kate, um, you are being lauded internationally with You Are Not My Mother. So tell us about that. Um, yeah, so I we were very lucky. We made the film on the... Um, POV scheme, the Screen Ireland POV scheme, which would have been known as Catalyst before, which was kind of going into it, I submitted with an idea that I knew could be pulled off for the budget or what I thought could be pulled off for the budget because it was kind of a capped budget at 400,000 euro um, for a feature film. Like that's pretty difficult to pull off. Um, so I teamed up with D Levens at Fantastic Films and we, I had this idea that had been formed from kind of like personal experiences with my family, but also experiences of people I knew growing up um, and their parents, but then also very much informed by um, Irish folklore and legend and um, all the kind of scary stories you're told when you're young about fairies kind of coming and taking you away to the other worlds, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so the two ideas kind of married together nicely, but at the heart of it, it was really about 
um like it, it it's a horror movie definitely like it has its horror beats but it, it, it a lot of people have said you know the heart of the story really is a family drama about uh a mother with mental illness and a somebody coming of age the protagonist coming of age within that family and how you as somebody coming of age deals with trauma in your family that kind of is inescapable so you're always gonna have to confront it at some point and hidden secrets within a family how they always kind of come back and float back up to the top um which I felt like the parallels with like Irish society and the kind of folklore that I'd heard growing up it felt like the two things kind of complemented each other very well um so yeah we went for the POV scheme with a very rough one page idea and then we got uh to the next stage which meant um fleshing that out well I actually we had to well I had a one page and then I went to D and she was like okay for the su submission in 10 days we need a 10 page treatment based on that one page idea so I was like oh. ah, okay and then I just like breezed through it really quickly but luckily we got into the next stage and then the next stage was developing a script with Screen Ireland so they gave us a script editor it was a great kind of um experience just to and as a first time filmmaker to have development on a film be so fast paced. So we kind of had the script and we kind of applied for that scheme in 2018, I think probably maybe in 2019. And then we were shooting the film in 2020. So it's doing a very fast paced kind of um, development process, which, you know, as a first time filmmaker, it's great to not be waiting kind of seven years to be making your feature film, your first feature film. Um, that is, yeah an yeah. incredible luxury not to be kind of stuck in development hell but do you I mean you've you've kind of you say you're a first-time filmmaker I know this is your first feature but you've been you know kind of it feels like your career trajectory has been always working towards this are you very much a horror writer director or do you or is that just what you've been drawn to so far um, I think like in my core soul I'm a horror fan through and through <laughs> I think you know I spent my days as a kid reading like Stephen King and obsessively watching kind of getting my hands on horror movies as best I could um and there's just something about it I think I find watching horror movies and writing them kind of comforting kind of taking off something Ali said earlier like I think it's like for me filmmaking and making things is kind of cathartic in like dealing with things or addressing your primal fears and things you find most scary. And I think horror films are a great way to kind of confront the deepest fears you have and go, okay, let's make a movie about this. Um, which, you know, it's it's uh, maybe a dysfunctional way to operate, but it's uh, I find it kind of comforting. And like, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I'll put on like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and I'll feel soothed. So. <laughs> A bit of comforting horror, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, like it's gonna, it's gonna be massive. I know it is, and I can't wait till it hits the the cinemas as well. So, congratulations on that, Kate. That's absolutely awesome. And um, so, if Ali is comedy and Kate is horror, Connor is comedy horror. So, <laughs> tell us about let the wrong one in. Um, yeah, well, I, I think this started uh, as a mix of kind of two different things. I, I always had an idea of a, of a vampire, a Dublin vampire, you know, very much. But I, I never really knew what to do with it. Um, and then there was also, again, it is this thing where maybe it's the older I get, the more I want to put in something of my own life, you know, because I've made a lot of horror films before. And some of them have definitely very much like, you know, uh, killer clown kills a bunch of teenagers, <laughs> and, and that's what it's about. Um, and uh, this, I, I, I really wanted to tell a story about um, uh, this personal experience I had, where I realized, you know, I had this friend in my life who was really um, very manipulative and annoying, and I used to complain about them all the time. And I remember somebody said to me once. I was going, oh, this guy is such an idiot. And they were like, who's an idiot? And I was like, this guy is an idiot. Uh, who's an idiot? And it just dawned on me that I was the idiot. Like, as in, I was, I was letting them, I was the one answering the phone. I was the one, you know, engaging, enabling all this. And, and so 
when I combined that with the vampire idea, it was it was like a vampire is just a vampire. That's his that he's he needs blood. He's going to go and get it. And so really, the film is about this other character coming to realize that they're the problem, not really the vampire, you know. Um, and right. that was kind of the core of the story that kept me, that, that sort of grounded it, I suppose. Even though there's all kinds of madness, I suppose, going on around that. Um, and so, and I, I, it was also the idea, like, I, like I've made a few other horror films and they've always been set in the countryside. And like, I'm not from the countryside. So there was always this, like, I don't know, I always felt I struggled a bit, even in terms of the dialogue. So there was something just really nice about, setting it in where I grew up in Dublin you know I, I even if I was on the bus I could hear dial you know you, you, your environment yeah. starts to influence the writing and um yeah so so that's sort of how it came and about. Do you think that that more personal connection is actually what connects better with an audience if, if it's if there's more truth for you even if it is a literal vampire like there has to be that truth in it and do you think that's really where the the brilliance lies? <laughs> Uh, yeah, totally. Like, I think, you know, again, it's something I suppose you develop in the films you make. And sometimes you make films go, why did that not quite connect? You know, what is it that's, you know, and I think with this, it's, you know, it is that personal connection. And then it's like, how do you also get that across in a, in a, in a script? Like, you know, and like some of the guys said, I worked with a really good script editor, you know, and he'd always say, structure is emotion. And I go, what does that mean? <laughs> and uh, it would be like, but it, but but there are ways to construct the narrative that 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 people feel those moments more strongly. And and um, Dervil on the film board was always like, you know, give it heart, you need to give it heart. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, yeah, character but, is but it, plot. <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, but, but then it becomes, uh, there's a point where you just feel it as you're writing, you know, it's, 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 it, uh, um, you just connect with something. And so I think that was the, that was definitely the big challenge for me with this one was to make something that wasn't just a straight, you know, it had an extra element, like it had something else that I wanted to put in it. Um, you know, aside from all the fun elements as well. Yeah. Did you find you had to be more vulnerable then as a writer that you had to put more of your kind of soft underbelly uh, inner thoughts and feelings into it in order to get that, you know, connection? Yeah, like, it's funny, like, you kind of think that and then you'd be surprised how, uh, you know, I'd be like, oh my God, I can't show this to my family. They're going to totally know it's about my, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, sometimes you'd be surprised how much that gets covered up when it's a vampire. It's like, you know, it's like, yeah. there's no way my dad would know that's about him, right? <laughs> yeah, we know, um, people never recognize themselves. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Connor. I'm um, really looking forward to that as well. Um, again, could talk to you all day about it, but we're uh, tight on time. So finally, circling back around to an Irish theme and mythology, uh, Donald, tell us about Cry of Granua, Cry of Granuela, if I can pronounce that properly. Uh, Grania Whale, yeah. Um, well, this uh, this film had, I guess, uh, two different starting points. Um, I'd had the notion of doing something around Grania Whale for years, and I was always kind of searching for what would be like just an interesting way to approach it. And I had another idea about like Grania Whale and a post-apocalyptic Irish future that never um came together and then i had a very practical second starting point when i met with this american producer who said if i came up with a idea that was like a vehicle for an american actress in ireland that he could raise a quarter of a million dollars so i thought okay that sounds like a bad idea i don't know if i can you know i was trying to think of like the, uh, there's that whole kind of subgenre of american Americans come to Ireland and um, it seemed kind of like, you know, they come and they find themselves or they have some romance. And it seemed like such a kind of cliche that I was like, I don't want to do that. But the more that I thought about it, the more I kind of started thinking of like a way that I could subvert that or do my own thing with it. And then I came up with 
this idea and connected it to Gran Uel and I started getting excited about it. And then um, that producer stopped returning my calls. So I was like, oh. oh, well now it's too late. Now I'm hooked on the idea. Um, right. And so then uh, I was uh, lucky to be able to get funding with the Arts Council through their new authored work scheme, which allowed me to take it in a kind of weirder direction than I would have had permission for otherwise. Um, and uh, because that scheme, I only needed an outline to get the funding. So I wrote like a four page outline, which was more about how the characters felt in the film than what actually happened. Um, and then I was able to, once I got the funding, develop it in rehearsals with the actors, which is how I did my first fiction feature out okay. of here. And um, right. kind of write the script through that uh, process. So yeah, it all worked out in the end. But there's really no one way into any story. Um, and did you find, and I'm obsessed with this, as I was asking Colin, th that the restrictions essentially helped you? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's always, um, that's always the case. And I suppose I had like the uh, kind of reverse trajectory to Connor in that like a lot of my earlier work was more directly rooted in my personal experience and people I grew up with. Um, my family background and um, this was starting from a, a more a place totally outside myself and then trying to find the personal connections um, on an right. emotional level um, so that was like a good challenge I think yeah yeah and um, like what what made you want to do that I mean like most of us are there's no as I say no one way in so what, what made you want to have that challenge of coming to it as an outsider nearly a woman a female character um something that you don't have any personal connection to um I think it just uh I mean it offered a as I was working on it I started to find thematically it, it related to a lot of uh my previous work um you know like the documentary I'd made before had been about uh, my father, who was an American documentary maker who came to Ireland and made films in Northern Ireland. So this was almost like a weird kind of parallel fantasy version of that, uh, that kind of thing. And then I think I also got excited at the idea of having a film that kind of morphs and shifts genre and style as it goes. I think I like when a film, as well as having tension on the level of like, dramatic tension, tension within characters, that there's a there's a tension in the in the style as well. And so I like the idea of having a film that kind of starts with a kind of more traditional setup of like characters who are going on this journey and learning about each other and then kind of morphs into something more surreal and fantastical. Um, so yeah, it just kind of created a lot of opportunities. And I, I like that with each project that you're trying to like test and challenge yourself in different ways. Yeah, that's amazing. And of course, working, getting to work with your lead actors um, it, to write it is such a luxury. So how did you convince funders to fund that, the development with actors as well as the writing development? Um, well, I mean, the, the Arts Council are very, very open to that kind of thing. I don't know how easy it would have been in another um, funding context, but um, they, I think, are very open and also very, it, it's just all about giving the artist total creative control for that. So it was kind of, you know, they, uh, they give you the support and then you send them the film when it's done. And if you, if you need their help, they'll give it, but there's not a kind of like, hands-on giving notes kind of um process so uh so yeah it wasn't it wasn't really a an issue for them which was great that's amazing I mean, I, i've done it before on out of here so i had some kind of track record of okay you had precedent to, to show them you could do it because i mean so much of the time you've got um a studio or a production company um or your funders who are you know breathing down your neck at every stage and you're explaining yourself so that that creative freedom is really a gift isn't it yeah although did awesome. you make it, 
did you miss it Donald sorry to put it in but I'm just fascinated by the to to do something like without any kind of restrictions essentially is that um is that also a bit daunting and that you don't you know you're not getting that sort of objective uh critical or constructive criticism I guess um I mean I think you I, I kind of you find ways to get it anyway and there was definitely there was plenty of restrictions in terms of budget and time and you know logistics and resources it wasn't like I felt like I'm so free um you know it was constantly coming up against uh limitations but then yeah I mean I made sure in terms of you know um my collaborators and just other friends and advisors that I'd have people who would um not uh not give me a kind of sugar-coated response to things so um that was still very much there was a lot of like feedback in the process still you have your tribe who will be honest with you and development everybody needs them awesome like the last thing i want to do is just quickly go around and ask you all what is next so um connor what's next Good. Um, well, a few things in development, I suppose. Uh, one is a, a, a slasher idea about um, about uh, somebody who becomes a slasher. So instead of the instead of the that's the storyline, if you know what I mean. Like at the, the opening scene is the sla like the Jason or Freddie getting killed, and then somebody has to step up to replace them. So <laughs> that's the concept. Excellent. Sounds great. Um, Ali, what are you working on next? Uh, I'm currently developing two shows for stage at the moment, and I am hoping to find somebody to let me make more films. I'm working on a range of different projects. Uh, a lot of stuff, obviously, involving gender, but uh, some, some drama, some comedy. Okay. I hope there's lots of producers watching who are looking for the next big thing. Um, Rena, what's next for you? Uh, next, I've got a feature in development with Screen Ireland called The Hive. Uh, it's kind of a siege thriller about a group of um, incel terrorists who take over a Dublin internet startup um, and wow. uh, start their own kind of weird and sadistic games online. Um, and a few other bits and things like TV and that and but also just doing everything <laughs> and anything and flinging yourself at any project and wanting to work with everybody and yeah until you until you fall apart from burning. <laughs> yeah don't do that keep doing the great <laughs> thing. Um, Jade what's next for you? Very much like Rena I'm trying to throw myself everywhere and try and do I'm being really greedy, trying to do a bit of everything, really. Um, I'm working on a commission with a really cool theatre company. Um, it hasn't been announced yet, so I can't really say very much. Um, nice. Developing my book, that's the idea, is to try and develop For screen? Book. For screen, yeah. Awesome, uh, nice. And, um, yeah, I'm putting my hand to directing in the summer, I think. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> Fantastic. Lovely. Uh, Donal, yeah. what's next for you? Um, I'm working on a, a feature documentary in New York at the moment. And um, then uh, various scripts and ideas that I'm whiling away on. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm really interested in, in trying to develop things with other writers at the moment. Because um, I think I've got... I've got a kind of bit more of the range as a director than I do as a writer. So I'd like to kind of um, branch out and particularly explore more genre things with other um, writers. So I'm kind of pursuing that at the moment. Everyone send your emails to journal now. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Colin, what's next for you? So uh, I'm developing two features in development at the moment. Um, both kind of period dramas set in the, well, recent kind of past, like set in the 60s and 70s. Um, one is about a faith healer. Um, and the other one is about a young woman who's going through the process of becoming a nun. Um, and yeah, so kind of working around those and just actually going to 
Berlin now in two days with the film. So we have a world premiere at Berlin. So very excited Yay. about that. Might, might see Rena there. <laughs> I don't know if she'll be there. Um, Yay. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Great. Thanks, Colm. And finally, Kate, what is next for you? Um, so yeah, we're obviously the film is playing at Diff on the 24th of Feb. I'm not sure when this will be online, but uh, we're playing at Diff on the 24th of Feb, but our film, You're Not My Mother, it's on general release in cinemas around Ireland from the 4th of March. So you can go to your local cinema and see the film, which is very exciting. Um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of what's immediately next, but I have two horror features that are in development uh, in Ireland. One's with Blinder Films and Screen Ireland were in development with uh, a horror feature called Breed, which is actually at the Berlin LA Talent Project Market um, this week. And then another project I have with Wild Atlantic Pictures, Savage Productions, um, which is called Silent Caller, which um, I've been working on for a while. So that's kind of almost at the a final stage of scripting which is exciting so uh yeah we'll kind of see what happens with those and yeah similar to everybody you kind of just like never know what will happen next in your life as a filmmaker <laughs> so you just like 20 balls in the air and you're like which one will drop first um so yeah excited to see what happens next and hopefully get to make more horror movies brilliant well this has been an absolute pleasure. You are an insanely talented bunch of filmmakers and I've loved speaking to you all. So a huge thank you to Ali, Rena, Kate, Donal, Connor and Jade and Colm and um, enjoy the festival and congratulations on your films, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Thank you.